So this is our last uh, video for the ecology unit, and in this one we're going to take a look at classification. And this is IV section 5.5. And in classification, we are classifying organisms. That's the whole purpose of this, is to classify and distinguish organisms into groups with similar characteristics and features. And so how we do that is uh, through this different levels of taxa hierarchy. Um, and we start with the biggest level is kingdom. Uh, and, and I've got this kind of way to help me remember the order of these. Uh, I learned this in middle school. Uh, you maybe have heard this, this method before, or maybe you know of another one. Um, really, you just want to be able to remember the order of these. And so it starts with kingdom, and that is the large, uh, overarching, uh, biggest branch. Phylum would be next, class, order, family, genus, and most specifically, a species. Um, and so the way that I've always remembered this is the little saying, kings play chess on fine green sand. Um, it's kind of catchy, it's a good way to remember this, uh, but there's quite a few different ways to, to kind of remember these different sayings out there. Um, and so when we are outlining the system of naming and identifying organism, uh, we do this in a couple, um, with a couple different specific portions to this. Each species has a name consisting of two different parts in Latin. The first, uh, which is always capitalized, uh, designates the species or the, the organism's genus. The second word, always in lowercase, names the species specifically. Uh, so both words uh, are always written in italics uh, if it's typed, or if you're writing by hand, it's always underlined. And so it's important to remember that the, the first word, the genus, is always capitalized, the species is always um, not capitalized, and they're both always in italics. It's those two parts make up the scientific name. Um, some examples of taxa hierarchy. Uh, first one that we've got here is looking at a panther. And so the kingdom that uh, this would belong to would be Animalia. Um, animals would fall into that, that kingdom. Uh, as we progress from man, uh, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, we get more and more specific. And so the family that this organism belongs to uh, is going to have um, other organisms that are very closely related. Um, genus even being more specific, and then the species is specifically this organism and this individual. Another example would be for a, uh, for a grizzly bear. And here in this image uh, breaks it down a little bit, a little bit differently. We've got a whole bunch of different organisms here that would fall into the kingdom of Animalia. And as we progress from kingdom to phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species, we get more and more specific. And you can see that uh, with the, the organisms that are remaining. Um, we've got black bears that stay pretty much throughout this whole portion until we get to uh, the very end with species here because they're very closely related to grizzly bears. Giant pandas uh, also being very closely related, um, stay until family. Uh, the red fox is less closely related and so it's separated at the family and order distinction. And so this would be an example of how we would actually classify a specific organism. And so what we're going to do for the, the last portion, uh, the, the last two parts of this video, is look at uh, classifying some different phylums of the animal and the plant kingdom. Um, and we're going to look at some general characteristics and then some specific groups that you're responsible for being able to distinguish for both plants and animals um, and some characteristics of those. It'll kind of be a lot of information, and so what I would suggest doing is pausing the video so that you can see all of it. Uh, I would take down some notes and then continue on to the next portion. Um, and I'll go through this kind of quickly so that I can fit uh, the information into the, t the overall time limit of the video, uh, but you can pause it, obviously, at any time that you'd like to. And so to start out with some classification of the animal kingdom and some general characteristics, one, we're talking about multicellular heterotrophs. And so heterotrophs, again, are organisms that must get their energy by consuming something else. Um, the cells in these types of organisms are usually very highly specialized by structure and physiology for particular functions. Um, usually their life cycle is diploid and the adults produce uh, haploid gametes. They're generally able, not all, but generally are, most of them are able to move and they have bilateral symmetry, uh, meaning you could cut them down in the middle and the right and left side would be mirror, imag mirror images of each other. Um, and they have cephalization, which is having a, uh, a head structure or a structure that um, uh, kind of has uh, a lot of different sensory neurons and inputs. Uh, for example, our head in humans or in dogs or in cats. Uh, 
And so let's take a look at some of these different animal phyla, um, the first being periphera. And this includes the sponges, and they're mostly aquatic and marine species. Um, and really what they are is filter feeders. Um, they, they don't really move at all. And how they get nutrients and food is by allowing water to move through them and then they filter out different, um, different nutrients and different food. Um, they have very specialized cell walls for feeding and for support and for reproduction. Um, and they have pores, as I, as I mentioned, uh, to allow them to be filter feeders. They might reproduce asexually uh, by budding um, and sexually by having free swimming larvae, but usually asexual reproduction. The second phyla that we're going to take a look at is Cynardia. And this is a really cool, I think, uh, different phyla of the animal kingdom. Um, just some really beautiful organisms. And this includes um, basically organisms with a hollow gut. Um, they're mostly marine as well. Uh, and live in aquatic environments. And some things that they include would be like jellyfish, sea anemones, coral, uh, some really beautiful things that we see in marine environments. Um, you could say that maybe they're a little bit more complex or a little bit have a few more structures than um, the sponges that we just looked at. Um, they have a couple different body forms that we'll see a sessile um, uh, hydroid or a floating medusa. Those are the two different body stages that we'll see. Um, hydra, jellyfish, coral, sea anemones would be some examples of these guys. Our next phyla is a group called the Platyhelminthes, and they are an interesting group. Um, they're essentially very similar to worms. Uh, again, they're, they're often found in marine type environments or in very moist environments. Um, they're, they're flat, uh, you could almost think of, the, of them as flat, unsegmented um, worms. Um, and they have a couple different body layers, uh, so they're a little bit more complex. Um, they do have a mouth and a gut, um, but they don't have an anus. Um, and they essentially feed by scavenging or um, uh, finding other prey, um, uh, other small animals. They don't have a circulatory system. Um, they have something called a flame cell for excretion and regulation of water and ions. Um, they are oftentimes hermaphrodites, but they rarely self-fertilize. And some examples would be flatworms, uh, parasitic flutes, or tapeworm, uh, tapeworms, which are one of the grossest things on the planet, I think. Um, and sometimes you can actually find these guys in uh, pond water samples. Um, um, you sometimes find these, these flatworms. And those that are found in the ocean and marine environments uh, oftentimes have some really cool colors um, that you'll, you'll see. Our next animal phyla is the Annelidia. And these are uh, essentially worms. Earthworms would be a great example of these. Um, they have some distinguished separate cavities. Um, they contain nerves, blood vessels, um, um, and they have a collection of sense organs and feeding structures at one particular anterior end. Um, our next one is uh, the mollusks, and this includes slugs, snails, uh, mussels, um, octopus. Um, they have these soft, flexible bodies uh, with no segmentation, which is kind of interesting, but they also have uh, something that's kind of cool, a, a head or muscular foot. Um, and then they have some sort of, oftentimes, oftentimes some sort of visceral mass that's covered um, by a, a hard shell. Octopus uh, obviously doesn't have that hard outer shell. Um, some of these organisms have very um, well-developed um, sensory neurons, uh, for example, octopus, um, and are actually extremely intelligent uh, animals. Um, they do have gills um, and sometimes occasionally lungs for exchanging gases, and they have this tongue-like um, uh, radula for, for feeding that helps them to feed. The last animal phyla that we're going to look at is Anthropoda. And this is a, a really cool group and one of the most numerous animals on the planet uh, because it includes crustaceans, arachnids, centipedes, millipedes, and insects. And so everywhere you look, anywhere on the planet, you're going to find one of these guys. They are literally everywhere, insects being one of the most dominant groups uh, on the planet. Um, oftentimes they have segmented bodies with some hard exoskeletons. Um, they have a very distinct head, thorax, and abdomen, uh, three pairs of legs and two wings. Um, they have compound eyes, antennae, mouth parts. Um, these are some pretty complex organisms. Um, the blood circulation in these organisms is in an open cavity uh, that surrounds all of the organs. 
and they have a ventral nerve cord with nerves running to each of the different segments of the body um, to help with sensory input. Um, a hugely diverse and vastly spreading um, phylum within the animal kingdom. Obviously this is not all of the different phyla in the animal uh, kingdom, um, but these are the ones that you're required to be able to recognize and uh, provide some distinguishing characteristics between, um, between these different phyla for IB. The next part that we're going to look at is uh, classifying a couple of the different plant kingdoms. Uh, some general characteristics of plant, uh, the um, plant kingdom. They're mostly terrestrial uh, eukaryotic organisms with a wall containing cellulose. Um, they're obviously able to photosynthesize uh, and they usually have two stages of their life cycle. The gametophyte generation that produces gametes and a sporophyte generation that helps to form spores. And so the first group that we're going to look at, the first phylum, is the Borophyta. And these are usually restricted to damp and moist environments. Um, they have very small stems um, and, and uh, have radially arranged leaves. Um, they don't really have much of a root structure um, and they're anchored by these kind of hair-like fibers. Um, they produce spores containing capsule growths uh, on the main kind of stalk of the plant. Um, and they have very flat uh, leaf structure. They're, they're not very big plants. Um, they're very simple. Um, and, and don't grow very large or expand very much. Some examples of these would include mosses, hornworts, and liverworts. And while they do, some of them do have uh, structures to help transport water, they don't really have a true vascular system as we talked about in the plants, uh, in the plants unit. And so uh, they're kind of lacking some of these more complex structures. The next group uh, of uh, the plant phylum that we're going to look at is the Phyllosinophyta group, uh, phylum, excuse me. And this uh, includes the ferns uh, with stems and leaves and, and roots. And they do have vascular tissue uh, for movement of water and nutrients. Um, they have a pretty elaborate leaf structure. You've probably seen these, especially in the Pacific Northwest. We've got them everywhere. Um, they produce uh, spores on the bottom side of their leaves. And so if you actually go out, you can see these sometimes, and quite often you'll see them. Um, and they're, they're, the spores are released very explosively. They kind of burst and spread out all over the place. Um, ferns have been around for a very long time. And those that are, are present today are uh, survivors of a dominant group um, that was present during the carbon Carboniferous period um, during uh, geological time. Um, and so this phylum has been around for a long time, and what we see surviving today are survivors of those. Um, our next group is the coniferas, and these are the cone bearing trees, usually with really long and strong stems or trunks. Um, they're really dominant in northern forests, and they grow really well in uh, poor soil. Um, the trunk will grow vertically. Um, and then have side branches uh, that grow out to give overall the, the, the tree kind of an overall cone shape. Um, they have waxy cuticle and other adaptations to help reduce um, uh, water loss and they can uh, survive uh, really low temperatures and high amounts of snowfall. Um, and oftentimes they have a mutualistic relationship with fungi that help them to survive in these poor so soil conditions. The last group that we're going to look at is the angiosperms. And we've talked about these already in our plant unit quite a bit. Um, but they are the very dominant land plants that include non-woody plants, shrubs, and trees. They have stems, leaves, and a uh, root-containing vascular system, waxy cuticles, and stomata. Um, they have flowers, which are unique, uh, that produce seeds. Um, and really some very complex me mechanisms of pollen dis uh, dispersal and distribution um, that often involve birds and insects. Uh, mammals, wind, or water, as we've talked about and discussed before, and they can be divided into monocots or dicots. The last portion of this video is going to look at steps to constructing a dichotomous key. And a dichotomous key is what can be used to classify a group of organisms um, and to identify a group of organisms uh, for their particular their genus and species or their particular name. And we're going to do some uh, practice with this and some examples of this in class, but I wanted to give you some steps so that you have an idea of how to do this and where we were going. The first is to examine organisms for the most significant features of a structure. You want to make a list, basically, of some very unique structures or characteristics for each of the different organisms. Second, list these features in some sort of table or matrix like this. And so then you've got um, the characteristics and you've got the different organisms and you can make check marks where they do or don't have uh, some of these different characteristics. Thirdly, you want to record or, or compare the structure presence or absence against each specimen and then record that information in the table. Fourth, you want to select a characteristic shown by about half 
of the specimens in the matrix and so that you can start dividing these specimens into two, into two different groups. And the eventual purpose of this is to get to do so many divisions that you get a single uh, individual organism on its own. Um, you want to continue step four to progressively divide the specimens into smaller groups and then each division is labeled with a critical feature that distinguishes between them uh, and create some sort of flow chart like so. Um, and then lastly construct a dichotomous key that reduces them down into a single organism with statements that can be yes or no.